Okay, welcome back to day six of Ravensburg Jane Doe here on Unsolved No More. Day six already, almost like a, a whole week. And we've come a long way, but still uh, a lot further to go. And we hit our first roadblock today. So this morning I got up bright and early. Uh, and went to the Dunstown Cemetery. Now, there's, again, because of the age of this case, discrepancy of when she was buried. Now, not where she was buried, so that's good. But in a newspaper article, it was quoted that July 18th, uh, 1925, she was buried. And the people that attended being the funeral director or three people from uh, the area as like witnesses I guess um, the church sexton and but the death certificate says July 19th and you now which one do you believe I mean if I had to guess I would go with the death certificate but just like the location of where she was found does it really matter in the grand scope of what we are trying to do here which is find out who she is no it doesn't really matter now if it gets to the point where we are looking at records um, and there's two sets of records people were buried July 18th 1925 and people that were buried July 19th 1925 I'm guessing there isn't a whole heck of a lot of them so if there is more than two I would be shocked I mean so it really doesn't matter you could figure it out but I went to the cemetery today I tracked down a great old gal named Nancy now Nancy is 86 years old she lives by the cemetery and she takes care of of the records of Dunstown Cemetery went right to her house I had her phone number I don't like talking on the phone I just went right to her home felt a little odd doing that not being on the job anymore you know what I mean when when you are on the job detective meaning you're getting paid by a state or a county or a local municipality whatever it may be I mean I've done that hundreds if not thousands of times that doesn't never really bother me but since I've retired and it's been what eight years I guess it just feels eh, I don't know I don't like doing it I don't know why but I had no problem really doing it here it was like a calling hey this is what I have to do um, so I just, and she lived right next to the cemetery. So it was a very easy decision. So this morning I go and meet Nancy. Uh, Nancy was a nice lady, 86 years old. Um, she made sure to mention that to me. She lives in the exact same house since she was born, which was in the 1930s. And she still lives there. It was amazing to me that part as well. She called herself an old timer. I loved it. Now, as great as Nancy was, she was unable to help me. She stated that her records for that church only go back to 1940s, like 1948. So, of course, you know, I'm questioning her to, as to, well, how, how were the records kept prior? 
1948. I mean, I understand you're saying your records only go back to 1948, and I'm sure that you are certainly telling me the truth, but there has to be records pre-1948, right? Because whoever was running that cemetery, they have to plot where people are buried because you don't want to start digging a hole and dig up somebody else and say, oh, well, I forgot that we buried somebody there four years ago. No, no, you have to have record of it so that doesn't happen. So those records are out there somewhere. I got an email. Now, again, I've gotten you know, hundreds of emails. Um, and if I haven't responded to you, uh, I apologize, but I certainly am giving you your, uh, your quote unquote shout out here for assisting the best that you can. Kathy, I believe her last name was Funk. I can't, uh, can't make that up. You know, that sticks to me, Kathy Funk. Sent an email about working for a township and to get a hold of Nancy. And I had already had that plan for this morning. So that wasn't anything new, but she was talking about going to the township and talking about a card system. And that intrigued me. So I'm, I'm going to follow up on what she's talking about there. Um, but the brick wall certainly was when talking to Nancy, she was all excited and she was happy to help, but you know, she just said that her records, they don't go back that far. And you know, I, I understand that, but I can't take that as the end all, you know what I mean? I, I, I just, that's, it's not a brick wall. It's a styrofoam wall. Okay, because those records are somewhere. Somebody has them. Somebody knows where this girl was buried. Um, but Nancy did take my name and number, and she was more than uh, willing to go through her records just to double check. And hopefully, you know, we'll get a phone call from her. To be honest, I don't expect it. Okay. But listen, that's how I am in every investigation I've ever done. I always think of the worst. That way I'm never disappointed. And if something good does happen, I'm ecstatic about it. So I never get my expectations uh, too high. But I was able to also view the cemetery. Not as big as I thought. So before I left this morning, what I did is I looked at, uh, I had to find Nancy's address and that was a, you know, it's a relatively easy job. But, uh, while I was doing that, I wanted to see where her house was. I had an address. I looked up an address and did a Google street view, right? I wanted to be able to see her house, what it looks like. So I don't drive past it. I don't rely on GPS to take me to the correct address. I need a visual. But when I'm panning the Google 360, what do I see? The cemetery. And I'm like, oh, there's the cemetery. I bet you yeah, that's Dunstown Cemetery. I've never been there. I didn't even know where it was at. And I'm pretty familiar with that area, at least the other side of the bridge where I went to high school. Or not high school, college, I'm sorry. So then I panned out and did an overall view to see how big that cemetery was. And it looked pretty daunting. I was like, oh man, there's like 5,000 graves here. But whatever. I mean, we're looking for a Jane Doe. You could probably cross out 4,999 of those that are recorded and we know who they are. So anyhow... But when I got there and I started walking around, um, it wasn't as big as I thought. So it was, it was, it's always odd walking cemeteries. 
There's nothing in the world that makes you feel so minuscule in life than going to a cemetery. Now, sometimes like going to a, uh, a football game, college football game, 100,000 people, I don't ever do that. I've done it, I think, once in my life. And you look around, and you're like, man, I, I'm small potatoes. You know what I mean? I'm one on 110,000 people just here in one little location. Think of the whole world. I get that same feeling being at a cemetery. And you, you just feel insignificant. I always feel insignificant when I'm in a cemetery. You look at all the dates, 1700s I see, 1800s, 1900s. All the people that are buried there, they were once somebody, and they still are somebody. But, as I always say, you're two generations removed from being forgotten. You know, I'm looking at tombstones as I'm walking through there and thinking, nobody, nobody comes and visits this person anymore. Some of the tombstones you can't even read. It's almost, you hate to say this, but it's almost like a waste of space. Meaning, if everybody, if this world continues the way it goes and everybody continues to get buried and gets a headstone placed there, the world will be overtaken by cemeteries. I mean, there's only so much land, right? Now, I'm being facetious a little bit, but you know what I mean. It's just... Everybody is die everybody dies. That's just the way it is. But as I'm standing there and walking through there and looking at some of those graves, I'm thinking of what that person was like when they were alive. Right? Cemeteries just have a an odd effect on some people, including me. And, and it's not a depressing state or anything like that. It's just uh curiosity more you know what that person was like and i can envision like 1800 when this person died a group of people gathered around this very spot that i'm standing you know 200 years ago and they're mourning this person and then like a filmmaker you know it shifts to the present day and things haven't changed that much you know, at that site. Just weird things like that. But, boy, I digress, didn't I? We were talking about a brick wall of hitting of no records for, for that. Um, but, I did see something there. It's like being at a crime scene. It doesn't have to be a murder scene. Burglary. Assault. And you stand at a scene and you you take you take a minute to just kind of get your bearings, look around, let the chaos that's all going around ar around you kind of push it away, and just take focus, block out all the noise. And sometimes you'll see something. Things become a little bit more clear. So I saw something. Now I want to read you. And I'll put it on the screen here while I read it. But this was... So Will Warren, he is a uh, um, an elite member and a, a big fan and somebody that... Um, comments a lot and I, I appreciate him and he sent me and I had read this article but he had sent me it and reminded me again of it because it helps a little bit it's a clue to where she is I guess for the most part um, it has something to do with her burial so it's important it says, Ravensburg Jane Doe was buried on the morning of July 18th, 1925. This is a quote. In a grave distant point in the Dunstown Cemetery, set aside as the last resting place of the friendless and unknown. Lockhaven Express reported only a handful of people were present to mourn Ravensburg Jane Doe, including Reverend J.M. Reynolds, important, 
who was who held a short service, the church sexton, important, the undertaker's assistant, important, and three residents of Dunstown. So in that short paragraph, we learned a lot that is useful. One is J.M. Reynolds, this church sexton, the undertaker's assistant, and the three residents of Dunstown, right? Let's try to let's try to identify them. All right. Certainly are probably passed away by now. But again, they have assistants, they have family members, and the stories could be passed on to them. Listen, if stories weren't passed down from generation to generation, we'd probably know nothing about Native American history. Right? Because that's how they pass down their stories from time to time. We would know nothing about Crazy Horse, Sitting Bull. Um, it, it's, we would only know what we know if when they interacted with the, the, the white people, the white settlers. So it's very important to try to identify these people. That will be not only a task for me, but I'm sure it's going to be a task for you as well. But back to what I saw at that cemetery. Let's go back to the first part of this article. She was buried in a grave distant point in the Dunstown Cemetery, set aside as the last resting place for the friendless and the unknown. So researching cemeteries, it seems like the people who have less money don't pay for burials uh, or even Jane Doe's are on the outskirts maybe of the cemetery. Now what I did learn from 86 year old Nancy was an area that was older, meaning it hadn't expanded yet. So she kind of pointed me in, hey, I don't know where she's buried, but if she is in there, which she is, her guess would be it would be in this one area. Well, I focused in that area. And I just saw something that stood out. And I'll let you have a look at what I'm talking about right now. Wonder. So you see what I saw? Now, just because she's a Jane Doe, I've read nothing that said that she would have been in a an unmarked grave. Now that's a, I've assumed that. I've assumed that from day one. But I've read nothing that says she was placed in the ground in an unmarked grave. I guess because she didn't have a name, I automatically just assume that if she doesn't have a name, she isn't going to have a tombstone. Well, that might not necessarily be true. Is it possible that she was buried with no name, no inscription, but they put a tombstone there to mark it? Sure, why isn't that possible? So when I saw this, and remember the quote, in a grave distant point in the Dunstown Cemetery, set aside. Okay, again, you're kind of using deduction. This is the area which she's in. So we've deduced it isn't over here, it isn't over here in that section, it's here. So we've deduced, we've already got rid of you know, 4,000 graves. It's within this 1,000 grave plot. This one looks different than everybody else's. Why? See how it is set aside? 
it's unmarked. It's on the most outlying section of that cemetery. You, you can't go another foot or you're going down a hill. Is this the final resting spot of Ravensburg Jane Doe? Well, listen, I'm just telling you something that I saw that stuck out. And I'm going by a few deductions. I'm certainly not going to say I'm 100% right. Um, I won't even say um, I'm 50% right. I have no idea. But it stuck out to me. And it's a possibility. I don't think it's a probability yet. It's a possibility. I just saw it. First time ever in Dunstown Cemetery. And I saw that. And I thought of this quote that Will sent me. An outlier set aside. Now most of the other tombstones that I saw in there, even the old ones, you know, from 1800s, they all had inscriptions. This was the only one in that section that I saw that didn't have an, an inscription. Now, the, here's a question for you. Let's just pretend, let's just, just say that it was her. Would they inscribe it, Jane Doe? Or is that not common back in 1925? Maybe they wouldn't take the time to chisel an, an inscription in it. And they would just, just put a placard there. I, I don't know. It's, it's just different, right? It is, it is an outlier. And you can see, or you, and you saw, how I walk around the cemetery along the outskirts because through my research that's where these type of Jane Doe's people with no money with that we don't it's not whether she came from money or not that's irrelevant it's could she pay for the the services you know what I mean that's all that matters to the to the the people hey if you got money You'll get a good tombstone. You'll get a good lot. You'll get a good location in the center of a church. And, you know, in the cemetery. Well, she didn't have that. She had no money because no one knows who she is. So they place her further away. The outlier. Maybe that's her. Maybe at the end, when we go through all the research and finally find it, it would be great if it came back to that. But I, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see how that plays out. Um, <clears throat> what else? We got great help, great assistance for the maps. The closest one that I could find was 1938. Ariel. Now let's talk about the maps for a little bit. Because, again, I'm starting to shift my focus now from the the crime scene location to her body okay she's in that cemetery somewhere okay gotta find her the crime scene location not so important to me anymore because i feel that she was dumped so i don't think it's a i don't think it's a crime scene location i think it's a body dump location Two very different things. I, she was more than likely, I believe, killed elsewhere. So, um, but these maps help me. Okay. The 1938 aerial map shows the camp, Ravensburg State Park. And it shows the roads inside that camp. And they're identical to the way they are today. Now, why, did, why is that helpful? 
because remember, we're looking for an embankment. So I drove those roads, which is less than a mile maybe, that is inside the campground. And there's no embankment there. There's no 12 foot embankment. So the only embankment is off of 880, off of the main road. And by the newspaper articles, and it says the road that leads from Rocktown to Curl. Well, as you can see by these, this, this was, there was only one road and there's no change. So I'm confident saying it was off of that main road. Now where the bank was, no, that, that's a completely different story. Um, I'm just confident to say it wasn't inside that campground. It was off of 880, off of the embankment. And I believe we can narrow that down even further to one side of the road. So that, on, that only one side has an embankment. Again, hard to tell, right? Because I know that road obviously had been repaved or not or paved for the first time. Um, and they created that camp and with the waterfall and everything in 1935. So the bank, the area obviously was affected and changed a bit. I have no I have no illusions about that. You know what I mean? I understand that. But I still think we can confidently deduce that it was 880, one side of that road, within a, a pull-off somewhere. It may not be the exact spot that I showed you guys yesterday. That was just a pull-off that is there today. And I assume that maybe that was they kept that same pull-off. You know what I mean? Let's say that that was a pull off in 1925. They just kept it the same when, you know, they didn't change anything when they made that a hard pavement road. Could be completely wrong there. <sighs> Big Rock Camp. So the article keeps, all the articles I find keep saying Big Rock Camp. I assumed that Big Rock Camp was just the name of the campground before it became Ravensburg State Park. It became Ravensburg State Park in 1935. So in 1925, obviously it wasn't named Ravensburg State Park. The articles keep saying what, Big Rock Camp. There is some indication that Big Rock Spring is on the other side of the road where I believe that this happened. And that is annotated in maps. It's called Big Rock Springs. Well, was that Big Rock Campground? Is that something separate from Rocktown State Park? That's, that's a question I have to clear up. Uh, I contacted a local historian. I read two of his books um, that... Uh, a friend of mine, Eric, had given me for the, I had all sorts of neat little things of when the dates, when things happened. And, uh, you know, it showed when the, when that road was paved, it gave the date or the, at least the year, um, when the CCC came in and built the waterfalls and changed that to Ravensburg State Park, which was 1935. But I've contacted the author of those and he hasn't gotten back to me yet. So when he does, hopefully we we'll get some more answers, especially about Big Rock Camp. Let's see what else. Clothing issue. I th again, got that cleared up. We got the automobile thing cleared up. Still have to look into Prince Farrington a little bit more in that house of, you know, ill repute from on Rocky Road. You know, I showed you the distance between Ravensburg State Park and where that was. If the girl was 
don't, which I believe she was. Sure, she it could have come from a hundred miles away. But why that location? It seems that the police investigators back in the day when this happened, it said there was, a, in one article I read, there was 11 missing girls from the Jersey Shore, Loganton, Sugar Valley area. That seems like a lot, but back in that day, I mean, how do you really track people? You don't have phones. So if someone decides to leave or something and go to New York and they don't tell their relatives, the only way they can communicate is through letters. So just because they're quote unquote missing doesn't mean that they're dead. Like today, you know, the present day, we assume, hey, if this girl's missing, they're automatically presumed dead. That's not the case back then. So they seem to rule out all the locals, which means, you know, obviously it would be somebody from the outside brought there, but there's got to be a reason why they were brought there. Uh, I have to look at now roads, okay, because now we're, we're moving out from the body dump location and seeing, okay, what is the access route? Now, Route 80 is a big corridor that comes through, and you could get off Route 880 or Route 80 to 880 in Loganton. You go over the mountain and you're right at Ravensburg State Park. Well, <clears throat> was Interstate 80 there in 1925? I have to research that because if she came from the outside, how did she get there? What road leads to there and why there? Is it somebody who has family in this area and they were familiar with Big Rock Campground? Um, it seems 880 is not a, and I'll have to double check this, but it doesn't seem to be like a main corridor, meaning you wouldn't be traveling through Ravensburg State Park to get to Ohio, you know, from New York or, or whatever it is. From what I've read, 880 in 1925 was not a very passable road. Lots of curves. Um, it just seemed like it was, and you have to go over a mountain. It was very difficult. So, if we are deducing that she was brought there, dumped there, and she's not local, but I'm not ready to give up on that local angle yet. But if I were, you would have to say, well, they either are from the area or know this area in order to dump her there. It's not a, a, a through fare. I just can't give up on the the moonshine, the the way she was dressed with the matching bra, matching underwear, and the and all and the silk. Now, girls, you can tell me if you're wrong, but you know, I've been around this earth for 50 years and I've dated, you know, a, my fair share of women in the past and I, I'm pretty confident in saying that when a girl f wears a matching bra and underwear set for the most part maybe they're expecting or going out on a date because maybe somebody's going to see that you know what I mean a lot of times that just doesn't happen now for some girls I'm sure they wear a matching set, matching color all the time. But if this girl was a working girl in that lifestyle, that would make sense that she would wear matching undergarments. And remember what I said in the very beginning, because she was shot. 
to me means you know something. It means business. It means this ain't personal. Unlike, you know, strangling. Um, I mean, and that's not 100% true. I, I know that. There's prostitutes that have been shot after a sexual assault. But with that moonshine and the prohibition and the whorehouse, all that located within 10 miles of where she was found, you know, makes me kind of want to believe that it's got something to do with that. But I'm not knowledgeable enough on... on uh, you know Prince Farrington, and I keep saying him because he he was what ran the moonshine. He was the bootlegger. He was the main guy, but he had a lot of people working for him. A lot of people liked him. Would somebody kill her, for instance, if let's say let's just run a scenario here. Let's say she was working. And she was a working girl in this house of ill repute, right? One of her customers works for Prince Farrington. He's a bootlegger. He runs Moonshine. He's in there. He's getting sauced up. He's drinking, having a good time. Um, and he tells the girl, you know, I'm making a run to Washington, D.C. tomorrow. And for some reason he finds out that she told somebody or she was going to tell somebody would that be enough to to kill her and dispose of her body i don't know that i don't know that answer i guess i'll have to do some more research on prince farrington although i did read his the book that guy graybill i believe he wrote which was a good book or what if she he told her, hey, we are we have a still. Maybe he took her to the still to pick up moonshine. And then somebody was there and said, Well, who's this? Why did you bring her along? And then, you know, hey, we can't have anybody know where this is. And they shoot her and kill her. You know, the location of those gunshots is, is very important. There wasn't three to the top of the head, which the newspaper reports. If you look at the death certificate, it actually says one to the right side, two to the top of the head. Now that changes everything. Um, because it means that she could have been standing and a gun pointed right to the side of her head. She drops after she's shot and then two at the crown of the head. So, it is a big mystery. And there's so many different scenarios. But I'm thinking of the end game, you know. I sit here and I think once we establish who she is, then you work that case backwards to try because then you can figure out victimology, right? Right now, you really can't do victimology. You think that you can because you're like, oh, she's got gold teeth. She was dressed like this. Uh, she had to be from money, but that's not necessarily true. So you can't really work victimology until you find out who she is. And then let's say you find out, oh, she does come from money. She did work as a sex worker at, you know, these type of places then it starts to come together. Now, it might not be any of that. You know, it could be, you know, she was a victim of domestic violence. Her and her husband got in a fight. He shot her and killed her and dumped her. Simple end of story. Right? I don't know. The way she was dressed, she had had to been going out on a date. And I'm by the domestic angle I guess 
I guess one way that we could start looking at this is I have to contact Guy Graybill from that and I have his email I'll shoot him an email or even the Welshans who does the historical stuff here and I I emailed the Jersey Shore Historical Society and they never got back to me it's one of my biggest pet peeves I hate when people don't get back to me I hate it that's why I try to answer all my fans I think that, that besides being appreciative I think because that I hate when it's done to me but I try to take a deep breath and say, well, you don't know what they got going on. They may not have even got your email. So slow down, Kenny. Talk, you know, put your anger aside. Uh, but I did email them because I want to find out about these prohibition houses, these speakeasies that were in the area. Um, I think that would be some good research. Because would, would a sex worker from one of those areas, are they brought in? Meaning, I'm sure they're not all homegrown talent. You know, you have a speakeasy in Loganton. Are the girls that work there as sex workers, are they from Loganton? I doubt it. They're probably brought in from other states. I have to figure that out. If... This is the angle, you know, that we're going to go down. And you have to explore it. It's not going down into crazy town. You know, you're not going out on conspiracy land. I think it fits. So that's more research. Listen, we're in day six of this. Okay. When we get to day 96 you know we'll have some more better answers but right now this is the way things this is how cold cases unfold okay this is how you do it step by step meticulous approach write notes make contacts try to not go so far out you know stay where your deductions take you you know, for example, we deduce that she's in this part of the cemetery. It may not be that tombstone, but she's in here somewhere. Okay. You get information in that, hey, the undertaker there was arrested in 1930 for taking body parts home. So there's a rumor that your Jane Doe is actually buried in Jersey Shore. Don't take the bait, okay? That is what I'm talking about, crazy land, okay? Maybe there's some merit to it, okay? Maybe he was arrested. But focus back in on your investigation and your deductions. Hey, listen, we've already deduced that she's here in this cemetery. I probably walked over her grave today, okay? Don't let that disappoint you. Let that be a win, let that encourage you. That's positivity right there. She's here. We've deduced that. Okay? She's here. We're not going out to crazy land. We're like happy Gilmore, right? Block the good, bring in the or block the bad, bring in the good. That's what we're doing here, okay? So it's a win. It's not a brick wall today. A lot of avenues to go down. A lot of theories we got to pull out. This is going to be a long investigation. You can't solve this stuff in six days. Are you kidding me? If, if you could, it would have been done in 1925. They worked on this case. Which leads me to really to believe that she was from outside this area. Because police probably knew. Imagine the population was so much less then. People knew everybody. Okay? Nobody knew who this was. Yes, she was decomposed. I get that. But of all the missing people that were quote-unquote missing, they couldn't figure it out. Why? Because she's not from the area.
I mean, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to say that a thousand percent, but, you know, that's, that's how I'm feeling. Could change. We'll see as we move on. Uh, so that's it for day six of the Ravensburg Jane Doe investigation. I hope you guys are enjoying this aspect of it. If you do, maybe the next case that I do, you know, we'll do the same thing. Um, I, I kind of enjoy getting out of the room here, you know, and going out in the field again. That felt good. Talking to people. Boots on the ground. I like that. So if you like it, I wish I could have filmed Nancy today. But I didn't want to, she was, you know, like I said, 86 years old. I don't want to make her feel uncomfortable. I already showed up at her house. I mean, she was very nice and, you know, very smiley and talkative. But I just didn't want to, I don't want to be those people that put a camera in somebody's face. You know what I mean? These, they're YouTubers. I'm not a YouTuber. I'm a detective. I, I don't want to be them. Okay. If you, if you do this job and you do it correctly, you can do it any way you want, right? But I feel if you do this job and do it correctly, you got to be professional, okay? You got to take into consideration other people's feelings, no matter what. No matter what. Listen, if we find out that this Jane Doe was a sex worker and it hurts her family members today, let's say we find a... Uh, a cousin, an aunt, and they're upset about it. That's important. You got to take that those feelings in consideration. Look, I almost did a case before this, a local case. It was uh, Kepner. This mother, and I believe it was her three kids. They were like aged 13, 8, and 1. Were killed, murdered, slaughtered in their house the teenage girl was almost disemboweled and there's some controversy there was an arrest there but there was a controversy because the innocence project got involved i had to get involved because of the innocence project and my the district attorney told me hey go over this case like a fine tooth comb because and let me know your thoughts of whether you think this person did it or not because we're going to release them so it was a big controversy not well known, but the Innocence Project was involved. The guy did get released. I had an opinion on it. I was I have the case file. I was going to do it. I mentioned it. And one of the family members got back to me and said, please don't reopen this. And it was like a brother, a brother in law. Minor no, I think it was a brother. Okay. I had another family member. It was like his daughter or something like that. She wanted me to do it. But maybe maybe some people would have went ahead and done it. But for me, it's just, it's just not worth it. I know you'll never get everybody to agree on anything. Like Kerry Culberson case. You know, Vince Doan would say, hey, don't do it. You don't, don't do a video about it. But, you know, I did. Now, again, he's not a family member. He was arrested and convicted for it, for the mur murder of Carrie. But um, I don't know. I just feel respectful. If a family member says don't do it, for the most part, I'm going to respect their wishes. Because um, I'm empathetic to them. And they may not even know the victim. Wasn't even alive then. But it affects them regardless. Um... The Jolene Witt case. You know, I had, after I did the video, I had a family member reach out to me and tell me that they didn't like it. That I should have talked to somebody else other than the sister. There's more people out there to talk to than just her. So, listen, and, and my response was, okay, I, I understand and I'm sorry for your frustration. My apologies. God bless you. That's all I can do. I can't be angry with them. That's how they feel. 
I may not agree with them. So you're never going to get people to agree. But I tried to remain empathetic when I, when I can. And so in this case, I don't know. In this case, 1925, um, it's different because not there's nobody knows who this is. They haven't come forward. If you do know who Ravensburg Jane Doe is, please come forward if you're related to her. We'll solve this mystery with a Q-tip swab of your inner cheek, right? So, you know, this is different. I'm sure I'm not going to offend anybody right now. If we were to identify her and, and label her as a sex worker, if that's the case, that might offend somebody. But listen, you, you can't be worried about offending people. You know, you just can't. You just do your job. Everybody's offended about anything. I'm drinking an energy drink. That offends somebody. Somebody out there that's watching this right now. They're offended because they're like, you should be drinking water. I'm offended. Listen, I don't get into all that. You know, being offended is one thing. Being empathetic and sympathetic to somebody because of a tragedy is something completely and utterly different. Now that I went on that dissertation, that's it. Day six. I'll probably do some stuff this weekend on this case. I'm not sure. Um, I got an exit unsolved that I got to get to, so um, we'll see. I'll, I'm sure I'll do some stuff on this case, but it might not be filmed, is what I'm trying to say. And I might come back Monday with day seven. We'll see how it goes. Head over to Facebook. I'm not a big Facebook person, but it's a good place um, to for me to upload photos of this case. So you guys can see what I'm talking about. Some things that I don't do on camera or when I turn the camera off and all of a sudden I start researching and I see something. Well, I want you guys to see it. And I can't jump over here into the camera and record another thing. I have it on my phone, screenshot it, whatever it is, upload it to Facebook. Hey, this is what I got. What do you think? It seems to work. There's a lot of comments. A lot of people are going there. No, I'm not a social media person. But I use it to my advantage. And my advantage right now is to solve Ravensburg Jane Doe. So, with that said, see you on Facebook. See you here next time on Unsolved No More. Mains out.